Jewish university battles in the U.S. Supreme Court to block LGBT club. So there's a lot going on with this case, and I will do my best to break it down. So hang with me for a second. Yeshiva University, a Jewish university in New York, has announced it will pause all student groups after the U.S. Supreme Court decision, um, a U.S. Supreme Court decision allowing an LGBT group on the university campus. Uh, YU Pride Alliance, an LGBT student group, sued the school in 2020 after refusing to recognize them officially. The university claims that the court case is solely about Yeshiva University's freedom to act according to its values without government interference. After the New York County Supreme Court ordered the group's approval, YU appealed the decision and got rejected. On August 29th, the university requested the Supreme Court to intervene. The Supreme Court rejected the request on procedural grounds, stating that all, all avenues of appeal had not been yet been exercised, and that upon completion of said avenues, the university may re return to the Supreme Court. In response, the university decided to suspend all student group activities while waiting for the legalities to play out. A lawyer on the student side, Katie Rosenfeld, stated that the tactics adopted by the university are, quote, a throwback to 50 years ago when the city of Jacksonville, Mississippi, closed to, chose to close all public swimming, school, swimming pools rather than comply with court orders to desegregate. So let me do a backup and a breakdown as I understand it. So there was a... LGBT group at Yeshiva University that wanted to be registered as a official recognized campus club because then you can get like funding from the school and stuff. They were rejected. So in 2020, they decided to sue. Now, obviously, it's been two years. There's been a lot going on in the courts. And Yeshiva University is maintaining its right as a religious institution to say, we do not have to do things that are against our religion and, you know, our practices, our beliefs, these kind of stuff like this. We have LGBT students. We, you know, prevent discrimination against them in our uh, discrimination policies. But that does not mean that we have to allow and recognize an LGBT student group. And so basically, they've been battling through... Um, the courts on different levels for a while now and there was a court decision from a lower court that basically my understanding is a lot of this is highly procedural and it gets really confusing that um the the the, the school would have to basically comply and recognize them and in the meantime, the school basically made an emergency plea to the Supreme Court to say, like, can you please interfere with this? Like, our rights are being violated, blah, blah, blah. So the Supreme Court very quickly looked at the case. And the Supreme Court then rejected the Yeshiva University's case. So people are thinking, oh, this is some huge win for the LGBT students. Not exactly. They rejected the plea of the Jewish university purely on the basis of technicality. So they said, you tried to come to us when actually you had several levels of appeal that were still available to you. And your arguments about why you should go straight to us, we don't, you know, we're not buying them. Go back down. If you have to, you can return here. So they're really not making any strong statements about the legitimacy of either side's claim necessarily. Now, there are definitely opinions in the majority versus majority. What? Yeah, I think they're called the opinions or whatever the, 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 the justices put forward. Um, and so here's where things get a little tricky. So the justices that were on the minority side of this decision were basically siding with Yeshiva University and against the majority that said rejected their claim on procedural grounds. And, you know, they're calling for recognition of the school's First Amendment rights and protection of religious freedom, all this stuff. And in the meantime, so what the Supreme Court said when they kicked them back down to the lower appeals court, in the meantime, they said, okay, we have to, you have to recognize this LGBT student group. 
And so in response, the school basically said, okay, instead of recognizing this LGBT group, we are going to block all groups. And they also use the Jewish high holy days as an excuse to block club activities. And in response to that, there was an organization for queer Orthodox Jewish people that basically said, okay, you are going to shut down all clubs to prevent this club from being allowed on your campus. In that case, we're going to take it upon ourselves as a queer organization to fund, we will pay for all the activities of the group of all clubs that just got shut down because you refuse to let this LGBT club go forward. So that's pretty cool. Now there's been a recent update in basically the LGBT student group has made a major compromise. And, um, Okay, New York's Yeshiva University and the LGBT Student Club reached a compromise after the university lost a bid to have the Supreme Court block a court order that requires the school to recognize the club. The Pride Group extended the compromise after the school said it would put all undergraduate club activities on hold while it took steps to follow the roadmap provided by the Supreme Court to protect the university's religious freedom. And so... YU Pride Alliance said that it would voluntary, uh, voluntarily agree to a non-legally binding stay or pause of the court order. So they're saying, we will agree that you do not have to follow the court order. In a, we made this agreement in a way that's not legally binding, but for the sake of everyone, we don't want everyone to be punished on behalf of us. So we will make a compromise for the sake of everyone else, essentially. Now, I was reading some legal analysis of this today, and like I said, a lot of this is very procedural. A lot of this is about how you have to read between the lines of when someone makes this minority decision versus that, and why did a, a judge flip and all this stuff. So a lot of it is above my head. But what I was reading is basically that if this were to go before the Supreme Court, the LGBT student club would likely lose and this would be one a major blow to student rights to lgbt rights and to secularism and so because this would be such a huge blow they are just like okay we're not going to push it we will let this play out in courts for a few more years because we don't want the supreme court to get immediately involved and actually lose a lot more than just our student group, like setting very dangerous precedents actually. So that was some legal analysis I read today, especially because of what was written in the majority versus minority decisions. There were like a lot of hints about how things would go should they appear before the court and not be kicked down on the basis of procedure. And basically those hints are not in the LGBT club's favor. So a lot of people are saying this is actually kind of the reason why the club is taking a step back. Now, there's a huge contention here because obviously Yeshiva University, this sounds like an explicitly religious organization. But back in the 60s, this school actually changed its category from basically a religious institution to a predominantly educational institution. I don't remember the exact kind of category, but they changed their categorical, how, however they're recognized by the government, basically to be able to receive government funding. And so because of that, there has been arguments before the court that they said that this is not really a religious institution. So you don't get to make these kinds of rules on the basis of religious freedom, because that is not how you were recognized in our, uh, you know, in, in terms of compliance, in terms of categories and stuff like that. Um, like the actual yeshiva part of yeshiva and university, the full-blown religious institution part of the university is now just an affiliate. So you, they're arguing that you do not have the same level of protection of religious freedom because you made this compromise back in the 60s to be able to receive government funding. And so this is like a huge back and forth that's been going on. And I think it will continue for a long time. 
All right, I'm not going to add any commentary because your commentary was very complete, and I think we should move on to the next story. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, should... Wait, there was a comment by D that I wanted to highlight, or I can read out loud. D is saying, <laughs> I don't see this ending well as the Supreme Court has been deciding cases putting religious freedom over anti-discrimination laws. Yes, obviously. So that this is an excellent point, D. Like, based on especially the current bench that we have on the Supreme Court, how they've been deciding things recently, including allowing prayer back in schools, allowing religious institutions to receive government funding. Um, it's, this actually doesn't, this doesn't look good for the LGBT club ultimately. And not only does it not look good for the LGBT club, but it doesn't look good for a lot of us. You can now get the sexiest blasphemous art ever known to mankind for free. Too sexy to show most of it here on YouTube. We draw Muhammad, Hindu goddesses, sexy hijabi art, Jesus, Mother Mary, Japanese God, Greek gods, and much, much more. Click on the link below where it says get our free blasphemous art.